This is VOA Africa. Good evening, I'm Heidi Adams Fitzpatrick in for Esther Gitubi Hewitt. It's Wednesday, July 31st, and this is Africa 54. Ebola claims another life in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Officials say a man confirmed as the second case in Goma has died. In part two of our four-part series on child brides, we'll tell you how one Tanzanian girl fought for her freedom. And it's night two of the U.S. Democratic debate. Who will fight the hardest to stay in the race? We'll bring you a live report from Detroit. We begin our broadcast in the Democratic Republic of Congo, where officials say a second man has died from the Ebola virus in the eastern city of Goma. There is now growing concern the virus is establishing a foothold in that part of the country. The latest case involved a man who traveled to Goma from a northeastern rural community in Ituri province. He was diagnosed a few days after he arrived. En outre, uh, we have already established a list of high-risk contacts. As early as tomorrow, we will start to compile a list of contacts, and those contacts will be vaccinated with the vaccine we have here. Health officials say the latest death is not connected to the first case in Goma, where a pastor died after he became infected while visiting the town of Butembo, one of the epicenters of the epidemic. The World Health Organization earlier this month declared the epidemic in the DRC's conflict-ridden North Kivu and Ituri provinces a public health emergency. More than 2,500 cases of the virus have been reported since the outbreak began in August 2018, leaving nearly 1,700 people dead. Very worrying situation. They're moving further east on the continent. Ethiopian Prime Minister Abi Ahmed and his guest, director of the World Food Programme, David Beasley, planted tree seedlings on Tuesday in a salute to Ethiopia's Green Legacy Initiative. The project seeks to combat climate change through mass tree planting. The Ethiopian government says volunteers planted 350 million trees in the past week in an effort to curb climate change effects. Here's VOA's Zlatica Hook. Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed launched his ambitious Green Legacy initiative in May with the goal of planting 4 billion trees across Ethiopia by October. He has given government employees and students time off to take part in the initiative. Agricultural officials say more than 2.6 billion trees have been planted so far. A record of 350 million seedlings were planted in just 12 hours on Monday. Excessive tree cutting has depleted Ethiopia's forests and expanded its deserts, contributing to a rise in temperatures, shortage of water, and demise of many animal species. According to the United Nations, forest coverage in Ethiopia has declined from about 35% in the past century to about 4% today. The rate of deforestation and the expansion of desertification, even at a global level, is because of the destruction of forests. This country was rich with forests before, but now it has been destroyed. So this is a good opportunity to bring it back to where it was. Scientists say regrowing forests is a way to help keep climate change in check. In Ethiopia's case, it will also help the country build resilience toward drought and maintain a more stable rainfall. The issue of environment is of major concern, even at the global level, but more so for this country. Most of the problems and famine we see in this country could be linked to the lack of protection for our environment. Ethiopia is not the first to engage in forestation programs. India is engaging millions of volunteers to plant trees in its environmental campaign aimed at increasing its forests by 5 million hectares before 2030. 
China has one of the world's most ambitious tree planting programs, known as the Great Green Wall, designed to hold back the expansion of the Gobi Desert. But large areas of Indonesian, Congolese and Latin American forests are still being lost to the loggers and palm oil companies. But there is more awareness of the damage they do. Zlarisa Hoek, VOA News, Washington. The Speaker of the U.S. House of Representatives, Nancy Pelosi, is in Ghana to mark the 400th anniversary since the beginning of the transatlantic slave trade. Pelosi is joined on her visit by members of the Congressional Black Caucus, including representatives Ilhan Omar and John Lewis. Now, the group met with Ghanaian President Nana Akufo-Addo and visited the historic Cape Coast and Elmina castles, where millions of Africans were shipped to the Americas. Pelosi also addressed the Ghanaian parliament praising the relationship between Ghana and the United States. Today, we reaffirm the message of friendship delivered by then Prime Minister Nkrumah to U.S. Congress six decades ago when he said, quote, the friendship which today exists between the United States and Ghana will endure so long as our two countries exist. That friendship endures because of the people. We are blessed in America with over 200,000 Ghanaians. Well, Pelosi is the first woman speaker of the U.S. House of Representatives to address Ghana's parliament. Girls who marry before the age of 18 often drop out of school, limiting their education and their lifetime earning potential. Voice of America's reporters spent much of the past year focusing on child marriage and how societies around the world value the worth of a girl. Well, today we hear from Mwana Hamisi in Tanzania who was promised to a man she did not know and used her voice to say no. One night, my mother told me someone wanted a domestic worker. I told her I didn't want to do any type of domestic work. Later, mom told me someone had proposed to marry me. She said the man was a good man and young, but I said no. I cried. My grandmother told me she had tried to dissuade my mom from marrying me off, saying that at 14 I was too young. My grandmother said I should go to a boarding school for religious studies. Mom got angry at my grandmother for supporting me in not wanting to marry. It was clear my mom was ready to give me away in marriage. I cried for days. I had gone to a primary school's graduation ceremony where someone announced that any girl being coerced to marry should contact the police. I'd written down the number. Grandma gave me a cell phone to communicate with the groom. I recorded his contact numbers. I called the police, who asked for the groom's name and the marriage date. My mom wouldn't give me the wedding date or groom's name. She told me it was none of my business. The night before the wedding, a local official came to our house to ask whether I wanted to marry. When I said no, he halted the ceremony. I began to study textiles at a center. Then a social worker transferred me to the Kiwahidi Center in Dar es Salaam. My dream is to become a great fashion designer. And you can see more of the VOA special report, Worth of a Girl, on our website at voanews.com. And be sure to join us Thursday here on Africa 54 when we will tell you about child marriage in the United States. Well, they are young, entrepreneurial, innovative, and eager to help build up their communities and their countries. And they are the Mandela Washington Fellows. There are about 700 of them here in America as part of the Young Africa Leadership Initiative. The program brings a select group of men and women from Africa to the United States for academic and leadership training. And each year, they all meet here in Washington for the Yali Summit. Well, VOA's Dilly Deco is at the summit and she joins us live. Dilly, you've been following the fellows. It's the last day of the 2019 Yali Summit. What do these young leaders have to say about their experience and what are they telling you they've learned? 
Good afternoon, Heidi. Uh, this last day is pretty relaxed. The participants told me that the six weeks program is perfect because it's extremely intensive. They couldn't have done it like a 12 week program. So I have next to me Belinda Magarira and also Emma Dion Encanta. So uh, Belinda, I'll ask you the first question. Belinda, please tell us about your project. Uh, so I work in sexual productive health and rights, focusing on adolescents and young people, and I pioneer a project called Citizen Child Youth Media Project, where we advocate for child rights using media as a tool. Same question for you, Emid Young. Yeah, so I run M3 Startups in Nigeria, just on consulting, education and agro. We help startups to transform into business ventures in Nigeria. Also we help students to choose career path in Nigeria. Also going to agro, um, greenhouse farming in Nigeria. We're going to export a large snail uh, to parts of the world like Europe that needs the snails from Nigeria. So it's a big project I'm handling in Nigeria. So after six weeks here, what's your biggest takeaway and how are you going to use it when you're back in your country? Well, I was um, in leadership in business tracks and I had the opportunity of, of being tutored and mentored by experts in the field of business in the U.S. And I, I think I'm going back with great knowledge on how to improve and scale up my operations as a businessman in Nigeria. I've learned a lot about human-centered design. I've learned a lot about um, leading um, as a leadership, I mean, as a leader that inspires and also builds trust and confidence in his team. Um, of course, that will help him to achieve the goals he has set for his company. So I, I think I'm going back with huge ideas and huge plans on how to improve on my operations back home, how to scale my operations, and how to transform other companies that I work with as a consultant. And on a cultural level, what would you say about America? Wow, America is a country of so much diversity, just like in Nigeria. Of course, uh, we have many ethnic groups in Nigeria, and I've learned how Americans have been able to work together, even in the midst of huge diversity. So something I'm taking back home to see how we can also bring that culture of working as a diverse ethnic groups, but at one in Nigeria. Thank you very much, Emid Young. Back to you. Uh, can you tell me, please, about what's your biggest takeaway and how are you going to implement that in your project? Sure. Uh, so we had a professional development mentorship. I was in the civic track at Rutgers University. So I got a mentor at an organization. So I would go there every Wednesday. She was really an amazing lady. So first thing I got there, she asked me, what are you going to do when you go back home? And I was very honest. I said, I don't know. I'm not yet sure. So she said, think about it, we talked a bit, then I heard something, I did send you an email. So she discussed with me, she has, she's a director, she has a lot of responsibilities, but she took three hours of her time to sit with me. We discussed my project, some of the practices they use at their organization, she gave me input, and it helped me shape a project. And I reached out to four of my colleagues back home, and I said, guys, this is what I think I want to do, and I need your help. So we are already in process of formulating documents for it, so it's going to be be a sexual productive health and rights organization that advocates for child rights using media as a tool. So, so far, I think next week we'll be registered. So when I get home, it's time to start implementing. So this morning, you guys had a workshop on going back to reality. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> do you feel prepared? <laughs> Uh, after the, uh, the workshop, I felt prepared because uh, before the workshop, I, I didn't really feel prepared. I was like the cultural shock, back going back home, and also people's expectations. So it's like you have been to America. People expect you to come with big solutions for every problem. So I felt so much pressure, but the workshop really helped me a lot. So now I'm ready to go home. <laughs> Thank you very much, Belinda. Back to you, Heidi. Well, as they said there, big ideas, big plans, and we've got big expectations. Dilly, thank you so much. That was VOA's Dilly Deco reporting for us live from the 2019 you, Yali Summit here in Washington. Well, now, we're excited to hear what you think about Africa 54. You can join the discussion on Facebook. The address there is Africa 54. We're also streaming our broadcast live on Facebook. Please watch and do share our show with your friends. You can also check out our headlines 24-7 on voaafrica.com. Coming up, we'll recap Tuesday night's U.S. Democratic debate and preview tonight's clash of Democratic candidates, including a live report from Detroit. Back in a moment. 
I am Sheka Sully, host and senior editor of VOA's international calling talk show, Straight Talk Africa. Today we'll examine the tobacco industry. We pretty much touch on anything that you can think of. Politics, youth health issues, human rights issues, you name it, we talk about it. The issues that we discuss are pertinent um, to most people on the African continent. A very, very rare and unique opportunity to interact with their leaders. Could be French, English, Portuguese, Bantu, Arabic. It is the beat, the African beat that counts. The beat does all the translations. It cuts across all languages and gives us the understanding that this is the African beat. It is so distinct and adhesive. It binds us together. African beat on the Voice of America. For more information, visit our website at www.voanews.com/africanbeat. Voices. We're talking about the news and issues you're talking about, sharing stories of development and growth across Africa, around the world, and in our lives. Topics that inform, empower, and change the rules. It's time for Our Voices with me, Heidi Adams Fitzpatrick, and Hadiza Kiari, and Ayan Bior, and Orion Itangi Shaka. It's time for Our Voices. Turning to U.S. politics now and Democratic presidential contenders opened a second round of debates Tuesday night with a flurry of attacks on President Donald Trump. But the 10 Democrats in Detroit also went after each other at times and showed growing strains between moderate and progressive candidates. VOA's national correspondent Jim Malone recaps Tuesday night's verbal tussle. On the first night of the second round of Democratic presidential debates, the contenders clashed over health care, immigration, and who has the best chance of defeating President Trump next year. Some of the more moderate contenders put progressives like Senators Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren on the defensive, criticizing their sweeping plans on improving health care and combating climate change. Former Colorado Governor John Hickenlooper. That is a disaster at the, at the ballot box. You might as well FedEx the election to Donald Trump. Senator Sanders defended his sweeping government health care proposal and noted polls showing he could beat Trump next year. And the reason we are going to defeat Trump and beat him badly is that he is a fraud and a phony, and we're going to expose him for what he is. Ohio Congressman Tim Ryan, a moderate, warned that Democrats could lose the election next year if they offered policies that went too far left on health care, the economy, and the environment. I, quite frankly, don't think that that is a, an agenda that we can move forward on and win. We've got to talk about the working class issues. But Senator Elizabeth Warren warned Democrats they would need to United offer States bold policy if we they really hope to defeat Trump next for. year. Democrats win when we figure out what is right and we get out there and fight for it. I am not afraid. And for Democrats to win, you can't be afraid either. Even though Democrats did plenty of sparring with each other, they often brought the debate focus back to President Trump, including former Texas Congressman Beto O'Rourke. In the face of cruelty and fear from a lawless president, we will choose to be the nation that stands up for the human rights of everyone, for the rule of law for everyone. Ten more Democrats will debate on Wednesday, including the current frontrunner, Joe Biden, as well as California Senator Kamala Harris, New Jersey Senator Cory Booker, and former Housing and Urban Development Secretary Julian Castro. Jim Malone, VOA News, Washington. Well, staying with U.S. politics, amid a boycott by some members of Virginia's Legislative Assembly, U.S. President Donald Trump on Tuesday commemorated the 400th anniversary of the body's first meeting in the historic city of Jamestown. On this day, 400 years ago, here on the shores of the James River, the first representative legislative assembly in the New World convened. By the devotion of generations of patriots, it has flourished throughout the ages. 
And now that proud tradition continues with all of you. Well, President Trump also noted the connection between Jamestown and the African slave trade, which he calls the beginning of a barbaric trade in human lives. But Trump was later interrupted by a Palestinian-American Democratic lawmaker who denounced the president's recent attacks on four minority Democratic congresswomen. Trump had told the congresswomen, who are all U.S. citizens, by the way, to go back to the countries they came from. Several Democratic lawmakers, including members of the Virginia Legislative Black Caucus, boycotted the event. Well, it's time now for our technology update, and joining us is our tech reporter, Paul Ndiho. Hello, Paul. Uh, hello, Heidi. Thank you, Heidi. Uh, Rwanda, Rwanda, like many African countries, is facing a severe shortage of app and web developers. Both the government and private sectors are struggling to recruit employees with critical computer skills. Now, Jennifer Batamuliza, a, a 2019 Mandela Washington Fellow who is studying leadership in public management at Arizona State University, is working to change that image. She teaches her computer skills, encourages, and mentors young women and girls in Rwanda to enter the field of science and technology. Jennifer, welcome. Thank you. Uh, tell me a little bit about uh, why you're here in uh, Washington, D.C. So I'm here in Washington, D.C. for a summit. Um, we've had six weeks. Uh, we had leadership in public management. We have uh, leadership in entrepreneurship. We have leadership in civic engagement. So that's what Mandela Washington Fellowship is all about. Uh, talk to me about uh, your programs back home. You mentor younger uh, women uh, to get into IT field. Uh, you are also a lecturer. You teach uh, computer science at uh, some of the universities in Rwanda. Yeah. So um, I'm a lecturer. I teach IT courses in Rwanda at the university. So apart from that, I also do mentorship. I mentor young girls in IT. Um, okay, I mentor young girls in STEM, but I focus mostly on technology. I teach girls uh, soft skills, like um, soft skills. I teach them practicals, uh, programming, uh, pro programming languages such as Java. I teach them uh, C++. I teach them networking courses, cybersecurity courses, yeah, and all that. Uh, how big is the tech market in Rwanda? So the tech market is very big in Rwanda because Rwanda is putting more efforts in technology. Uh, and Rwanda wants to go cashless. It wants to become the tech hub in Africa. So Rwanda is investing a lot of money in, in the, especially in young people. So that's why I want to be part of, of that. So um, Rwanda wants to go cashless. Uh, now we have many uh, programs in Rwanda. We have many applications such as Tap and Go. We have eSoco, eMarket that helps uh, farmers to buy their, I mean, to know the prices of their crops and many other things. Uh, very briefly, what's your takeaway from uh, this uh, fellowship? So takeaway from this fellowship, uh, I've done networking. The fellowship is about networking. The fellowship is also about leadership. So um, I've developed my leadership skills um, and I'll use this uh, back home. Uh, I'll use that in my mentorship program, although I teach uh, IT. So I'm going to also include some uh, leadership skills such as public speaking um, and many other courses on leadership. Well, uh, Jennifer, thank you so much for stopping by. Thank you, Jennifer. But Tamriza is a 2019 Mandela Washington Fellow. That's uh, today's uh, Take a Reporter. Back to you, Heidi. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. IT, it's all Greek to me. And be sure to join Paul and Dio each Wednesday for another tech segment right here on Africa 54. Now, earlier we brought you the highlights from last night's Democratic debate in Detroit, Michigan. And tonight it is round two. Another group of 10 candidates will face off again and introduce themselves 
to the American electorate. And so for more on what we can expect to see in tonight's Democratic debate, we go live now to Detroit, where our political reporter, Philip Crowther, is standing by. Philip, a very good evening to you. Very good evening to you. What do the front runners, especially Joe Biden, have to do tonight to stay ahead of the pack? Well, it's not an easy situation for the former Vice President Joe Biden to be in because he will want to improve on what he did in Miami pretty much exactly one month ago. At the time, he was already the front runner, and he's clearly still the front runner right now. But he was attacked on stage by Senator Kamala Harris of California, and he was attacked on his record, his political record on racial segregation, and he did not have a strong reply. So what Democratic voters will be looking for will be a stronger Joe Biden on stage, someone who is more likely to defend himself. He already said in the forefront of this debate that he was going to be less polite. So that's what we can expect to see on stage. But much like last night, he will be surrounded by a lot of candidates who are not polling very well, who could be off that stage by the time the next one comes around next month, and they will want to make headlines themselves. They will want to attack the two front runners on this debate, at least. They will be Kamala Harris and Joe Biden and will somehow maybe want to create a viral moment for themselves to survive in this frenetic battle uh, for the Democratic nomination. Now, now, Philip, you know, we've been talking about how early in this race this still is. How do these debates really help thin out the field? Because if you really look at it, it is as much a race about money as it is a race for votes, right? Yeah, you're absolutely right. There are simply too many Democratic candidates right now. The Democratic Party itself knows that. There are so many, in fact, as you know, that there are 20 candidates that qualified for this debate here in Detroit. That's why they had to uh, divide that field into two, 10 candidates on stage last, time, last night, 10 candidates again on stage this Wednesday night. And the chances are that there are a lot of people, a lot of men, men and women on that stage tonight in the Fox Theater here in Detroit that you won't be seeing again because the rules will be tighter going into the next debate in Houston. They will all have to poll higher than 2%, and there are a lot of candidates on stage who are polling around the 1% mark or lower. So what can they do to somehow make headlines for them, themselves? Well, maybe create that one short viral moment, maybe that moment where they attack another candidate. It really is the last chance saloon for a lot of these Democratic candidates that you saw last night and that you'll see again tonight on stage here in Detroit. And Philip, speaking of that viral moment, is the only way to create that to go on the attack? I mean, is there anything that these candidates can say about themselves, their policies, their vision for the future that can really help them stand out or will attack politics be the order of the day? Well, let's look at what happened last night. Uh, we had a little bit of both. Uh, so there was plenty of substance, of course, in this debate. There were long discussions about health care, how health care should be reformed, what role the federal government should be playing in health care in the United States. A whole 30-minute long debate, in fact, uh, that those 10 candidates had on stage last night. That is some serious, uh, su some serious substance on stage. But there are candidates, of course, looking for that one key moment. One example, I just spoke to the former governor of Colorado, John Hickenlooper. He created one of those uh, viral moments for himself last night. Maybe he didn't do so deliberately, but there it was, being replayed on the TV news channels here in the United States again and again. He threw his arms up, simple as that. Uh, seemingly imitating Bernie Sanders, the senator from Vermont, and that just created something visual, a viral moment that maybe gives him the chance to move on to that next debate. It is as simple as that. Philip, excellent reporting there for us. Our reporter, Philip Crowther, reporting us to, for us from Detroit, Michigan. Philip, thank you. And that is our show for today. Thank you for joining us here on Africa 54. Until next time, it's goodbye.